Okay, so um, we're going to start with exponential functions today, and we'll look at uh, two different kind of varieties. Um, exponential functions can be written in two ways, typically a standard form and an exponential uh, and a continuous form, and we'll kind of see both of those. So let's jump over, and we'll start with a definition. Um, so an exponential function. is one that has the form um, f of t equals a b to the t. Well, I mean, you could use x as well, but a lot of times um, exponential functions are, are used to describe situations that have uh, time as the input variable. So when that's more common, you'll often see t as the uh, independent variable rather than x. So there's some requirements on these constants. One is that a is greater than zero and b is greater than zero. And additionally, the base cannot be one because if b were equal to one, then that doesn't really do anything, right? One to any power is always one. So um, this is characterized by a multiplicative change in the output. So for an additive change in the input, the linear function gives you an additive change in the output. Now for an exponential function, an additive change in the input will give you a multiplicative change in the output. So that's what, uh, characterizes these things mostly. Um, B is the exponential base. And 0 comma A is the y-intercept. And I'm going to mention the continuous form now, um, although uh, we're not going to, well, maybe by the end of today we'll see it, but um, so another form the continuous form is uh, y equals or I, we're using f, so let me change that to f of t. Uh, kt, something like this. So um, where e is Euler's number, which is, you know, about 2.718. It's an irrational number. We'll talk about it in a bit. But for calculus, it ends up being the preferable way to think about these exponential functions. Uh, we'll, we'll often use the uh, continuous form in calculus. But let's uh, think about the two possible graphs. So exponential functions essentially will only have two graphs that they look like. So you could experience exponential growth or exponential decay. So growth is rising as we move to the right. So this is exponential growth. And it happens when B is greater than one. Um, so that's the, the exponential base, remember. So essentially what you're doing is you're multiplying by something bigger than one each time. So eventually... It gets larger and larger and larger. Whereas if you're multiplying by a number between zero and one, things are going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. So they'll trend towards zero. So this is exponential decay. Um, 
This happens when b is between 0 and 1. Remember, b has to be a positive number, and it's not allowed to be 1. So that takes care of all the possible values. So, I mean, just a quick for example, you could have something like y equals 2 to the t. Um, and over here, maybe we have y equals 1 half to the t. And, you know, you, you can see how these things go faster based on changing their bases. So we could hop over to Desmos really quick. Um, to have a look. So uh, again, I like this graphing calculator tool, Desmos, D-E-S-M-O-S. So we, we could look at the two graphs we just saw, y equals 2 to the t um, versus y equals 1 half to the t. These are actually mirror images about the uh, y-axis. You might want to think about why that's true. Whoops. I, wanted, I didn't want these parentheses in the denominator. It'll look the same, but why is there a zero? Okay, so those are the two graphs. Um, we can look at a variety of bases and see how they change too. So um, I wanted that to, the caps lock is on. Um, let's say we had, uh, I don't know. Notice how you can make it flatter versus uh, sharper. So let's look at some, some things smaller, but still bigger than one. Let's say y equals... 1.5 to the t. Notice that's a bit flatter. And then y equals 1.25 to the t. Flatter still. Um, as you zoom out, you'll see that eventually these things all do get quite large quite fast. Once you reach a critical mass, the things start to really get faster. And again, you, you can uh, you can increase the base bigger than two and we'll have ones that are steeper. So maybe we have y equals 2.5 to the t. Steeper and then maybe y equals three to the t. Steeper still. So you can play around with those and get an idea about how the graphs change uh, messing around with Desmos. Um, and then notice all of these have a y-intercept at one, because I didn't put any numbers in front. If I wanted them to have a y-intercept of two, I could just multiply in front by two, so two times. It moves that y-intercept up, like we were talking about. So if you multiply all of these by two, we'll just change the y-intercept. Now all the y-intercepts are at two. And we see, again, they're all still going to go to infinity quite rapidly. OK, so similar to what we did with uh, linear functions, we'd like to know how many points do you actually need to uh, determine the equation of an exponential function. If you know the behavior as an exponential, you really only need two. There's only two parameters, a and b, and if you have two points, then you can make two equations with two unknowns, which typically we can solve. So let's go ahead and look at how we might do that. So in this example, let's uh, find the exponential function that passes through two comma 10 and four comma 75, uh, 475. So the main thing is we're just taking that equation that we had y equals a b to the t and uh, plugging it into both. So we have y equals a, b to the t. So for each of these uh, ordered pairs, the first component is a t value and the second component is a y value. So um, if we plug both of these in, typically I like to plug in the one with the uh, uh, larger t value and that'll be clear in a moment, but let's go ahead and do that. Let's plug in four comma 75. Well, that would be 75 replaces y and then 4 replaces t, 
And then for the second one, we'll plug in 10, 2. So 10 replaces Y and 2 replaces the T. Now, the way to get these equations together, I think, is to just take ratios. And that's the reason I wanted to plug in the larger T value first, because if we take ratios, then uh, what we're going to end up with is we're going to end up with AB to the fourth over AB squared. And when you subtract the exponents, you're going to end up with a net positive exponent if you uh, have the larger one on top. Uh, if you do it the other way, you're going to end up having to fool around with negative exponents, which I think often can cause some mistakes. So if both of these are equal, if you make fractions out of them, those fractions will have to be equal as well uh, because the numerators will be equal and the denominators will be equal. So on the one hand, the fraction would be 75 over 10. And on the other hand, it would be AB to the fourth over AB squared. So we end up with 7.5 equals B squared. Again, B has to be positive, so that's all we have to do to solve this is take the positive square root. We don't have to worry about both solutions since it's a requirement that B is a positive value. So this comes out to about 2.74. Okay, so we still have the job of finding A, but now we know a little bit more what our equation looks like. It's Y equals A times this 2.74 to the T. So uh, plug in one of your points and solve for A. So I'm gonna plug in two comma 10, 10 for Y and two for T. And then we just divide both sides by this number, this 2.74 squared. And we get 1.33 is the value of A. So our exponential function that we were looking for is 1.33 times this 2.74 to the T. So does anyone have any questions so far? No. Okay, let's continue with another example. So let's do another one of these just so we kind of get in the habit. So find the exponential function that passes through Uh, 2 comma 80 and 5 comma 40.96. So I've kind of pre-calculated these so they work out nicer. All right, so same step. Uh, we want to plug both of these things into that form. Again, choose the larger ordered pair first, or the ordered pair with larger T value first. So again, 40.96 would go where Y is, and that would be about A, B to the fifth. And then 80 would go where y is, and that would be a, b squared. So again, we can take our ratios, and we get 40.96 over 80 equals a, b to the fifth over a, b squared. So we have 0.512 equals b to the third. The A's both cancel, and with the B's, remember that we're subtracting the exponents. So five minus two is how I'm getting that three. And then remember to undo the third power, you can either do the third root or raise both sides to the one third power. So on the calculator, if there's not a root button, you're gonna have to use the uh, fractional exponent. So we end up with 0.8 is equal to B. And then again, the same way, we move over here and we have y is equal to a times this 0.8 to the t. Plug in one of your points. I'm going to plug in 80 and 2. So when you divide by this 0.8 squared, we have solved for the value of a. And that comes out to 125. 
So our equation is y equals 125 times 0.8 to the t. Okay, uh, another thing we can talk about is percent change. If you have a, uh, a function that's changing multiplicatively in nature, like the uh, exponential function, that's characterized by a constant percentage change. So um, the question might be, how does the exponential base relate to the percent change in the output. So uh, it's not so hard. You just have to take the base and set it equal to 1 plus r. And then you'll have to solve that equation for whatever you're uh, thinking about. So if we write. B equals one plus R. R is the percent change. And then if the percentage is negative, it's decay. If it's positive, it's uh, uh, growth. So in the previous example, when we just did B was 0.8. So we can take the uh, equation that we have and set 0.8 equal to 1 plus r and then solve for r. So we would subtract 1 on both sides. So we would have negative 0.2 is equal to r. So this tells me that uh, the output is decreasing by 20% each unit increase in, in t. Uh, So we don't have to make it a negative if we say it's decay. And that's that. Okay, so back to the uh, continuous form. Um, so... So the continuous form we mentioned before, but you know, let's just recall it. The continuous form of an exponential function is given by y equals a e to the kt, um, where e is Euler's number, which you know is uh, 2.71828 and so on. It's a irrational number like pi, so the decimal expansion never stops and never forms a, um, you know, uh, repetition. Okay, um, w one thing to remember, uh, you might wonder where that number comes from. Um, if you haven't seen it before, I'll show you real quick. Um, actually, what, what this number is, is it's technically, we haven't talked about limits yet, but just think of it as plugging in bigger and bigger values of n here. If you take the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 plus 1 over n to the n, this turns out to be exactly Euler's number. So it converges. So uh, I, I could show you very, very quickly on Excel how this would work. 
Um, so let's uh, let's say we have n, and then we have our one plus one over n raised to the nth. So these are our two columns. So let, let's start with maybe what would happen if you would plug in one. So um, you would just get the value. Well, we know the answer is going to be two, right? Because one plus one over one raised to the first is two. But I'm just typing the formula in here so that we uh, can plug in larger numbers and it will compute it for us. Okay, so we get two as we saw. So we can plug in some bigger numbers. Maybe maybe we want to plug in 10 and maybe 100, maybe 500, 1,000, 1,000, and see what happens. Okay, so... Uh, it's having trouble with these numbers. Why is that? Because 10, 1 1.1 to the 10th is not this large number. Why is it having so many problems? Ah, uh, 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 there's an error in the formula. It's because it's not A2, it's 1. A2 just happened to be 1 the first time I chose it. So that, that's, that was a problem. I made a mistake in the formula. Okay, so now if we fill down, we shouldn't have those problems. Okay, so we we see we're getting we're getting better values now. So notice, yeah. So once you get to ten thousand, you're at two point seven one eight, uh, and then it should be two eight. So it's it's zooming in on that number. That number is the limiting value as you uh, plug in larger and larger values. There's going to be a computational error at some point here because the the memory of the or the computing power of the the machine can only handle such a large float so if you plug in something too big you may just get an error or not a number or something like that let's plug in a hundred thousand see if it can do it yeah so it gets it and then it gets this fifth constant right so essentially we're getting one more decimal place of accuracy every zero we add on here so this this method is pretty slowly converging but we see it does converge anyway if you hadn't seen where uh e comes from i thought i'd show you um, let me check and see. Are there any questions? No. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about um, uh, converting between the standard form <coughs> and the uh, continuous. So one can easily translate. between the continuous form and standard form by setting B equal to E to the K and solving for whichever one is missing. Unknown parameter. So let's look at some examples where we convert a few. So let's say we want to first convert to continuous form. Yeah. Scroll up a bit if you. So let's say we have y equals 300 times 1.12 to the t. Again, with all of these, you can also think about what is the um, percent change. That's something good to have in the back of your mind just to 
keep the uh, relationship fresh. Again, notice this one would have a y-intercept of 300. The base is 1.12, and we know that the um, percent change would be 12 because 1.12 minus 1 would give you that value of r. Okay, but what we're looking for here is to try to convert. So we have 1.12 equals e to the k. And the way you can solve for k is taking the natural log of both sides. Now, we're going to get into logarithmic functions in the next section, but since you're just solving for e to the k, there's, there's nothing complicated to do there. You just take the natural log, and the natural log will cancel out with e, and you'll just be left with a k. So it's not a, not a difficult thing to do. So I'm not going to avoid it at the time being. So basically, you can plug that into your calculator, and you get something like 0.1133 is the approximate value of k. So your uh, exponential function can now be rewritten in the standard form, or this continuous form, which would have the same base, the same number in front, 300, but now we just write it as e to this point, 1133t. So that would be the continuous form, if you will. All right, let's do one more for good measure. Um, let's say we have y equals 78 times 0.9 to the t. So uh, again, we would just set the base 0.9 equal to e to the k. Take the natural log of both sides. And then you get your answer. You plug that into your calculator, you get something like 0 0.1054. That's what K is. So we have our function Y equals the same number in front, 78, uh, times E to this value, negative 0 0.1054 uh, to the T. That is the continuous form. So I'll give you a minute to catch up, and then we'll move on to converting the other way from continuous to standard, which is even easier. Okay, so let me check and see if anyone has posed any questions. Questions yet? Okay. Let's uh, move back and go the other way, and then we'll look at some uh, interest formulas where this, where maybe you've encountered this previously. So let's go the other way. Example. Convert to standard form. So A, let's say we have Y equals 700 E to the 1.3 T. Uh, this is even easier. Basically, the E to the 1.3 becomes your base. So e to the 1.3 becomes your base b. So you just type that into your calculator. You get about 3.67. That's approximately the value of b. Again, I am doing a little bit of estimating there. So this is not exactly perfect. Um, but then your function just looks like 700 times this 3.67 raised to the t. And that's it. That would be the approximate standard form of this exponential function. Well, let's do another one. Maybe uh, you have something that looks like 1,000 times e to the negative 0.2t. 
So again, you're just taking the e to the negative 0.2 and punching it into your calculator. And here you get something about 0.819. Um, so this is approximately b. So your function looks like y equals 1,000 times e to the, uh, uh, there's no e because we're in standard form, apologies, times 0.819 to the t. And that would be your function. One thing I'll tell you that I didn't mention before with the graphs, but uh, that comes up. If you look at the constant and the exponent when you're in continuous form, it will also tell you when you have exponential growth versus exponential decay. Now, notice that e to the zero would be one. So if you have e to a uh, positive power, it's actually gonna always be exponential growth. Your base would be bigger than one. Whereas if you have e to a negative um, exponent, that is gonna be between zero and one. So e to the negative 0.2 here, notice was about 0.819, which is between zero and one. So anytime that k value in the exponent is positive, you have exponential growth. And anytime that k value is negative, you have exponential decay. So um, that's, that's one thing that you uh, might have noticed, but uh, I wanted to point it out as well. Okay, so a common thing we do is uh, these exponential functions uh, manifest themselves when you talk about interest or compound interest. And uh, there's two formulas that have, you know, some, some things in them, but you'll immediately recognize them as uh, exponential uh, functions. So let's have a look. Maybe I went a little too far there. The work on the screen, but we have these compound interest formulas. So one is, I would say, finite compounding. where there's a certain number of compounding periods and, and that depends on if you're doing it yearly, if you're doing it monthly, if you're doing it quarterly, if you're doing it daily, uh, you can make the number of times you compound the interest larger and larger and larger. But there is a limit to how much that you make from compounding alone and that is actually where the uh, continuous form comes in and we have continuous compounding. So uh, this formula is A equals P to the one plus R over N to the NT. And the continuous compounding simplifies greatly. It is just A equals P times E to the RT. Since you're taking a limit of n as n goes to infinity, all the n's are removed from the formula that you have in the finite case. So let me explain what all these letters mean. Um, so A is the future value or the principal investment, or excuse me, accrued amount, A for accrued. P is the initial investment or principal. R is the interest rate as a decimal. Um, N is the number of times compounded annually. And often this number n, there will be some sort of code word in the problem that will alert you to what it should be. Like if we say it's compounded monthly, that would mean n is 12. If it's compounded um, quarterly, n would be 4. If it's compounded, say, um, that you could do something like bi-monthly or semi-monthly, depending on the, the, a common one for pay periods would be bi-weekly. Bi-weekly would be every two weeks. So that would be 26 times per year, 
or you could do semi-monthly, which is twice per month. So that would actually be 24 times per year. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, T is just the total time in years. So let's go ahead and look at um, doing a couple of these using these formulas. Um, so example, compute the future value of an investment of $30,000 at 8% for five years. If, and we'll look at two cases, uh, A, or, or maybe a few more, I'm not sure, compounded annually. So that means N is equal to one. So here we were, we're looking for A, so that's going to be our principal, 30000 the amount we're starting with. And then we've got 1 plus uh, the interest rate as a decimal divided by N. But N is 1 here, so that doesn't do anything. So it's just going to be 1 plus 0 0.08 and then raised to the N times T. But again, N is 1, so it's not doing anything. So this is just to the fifth power. Um, and this comes out to 44000 $79.84. You could look at B. What if we compound quarterly? So this is, that means N equals four. So how would it change? Well, now we would have A is 30,000 times one plus or 0 0.08, which is now being divided by four. And now the exponent is gonna become um, four times five. So the exponent is 20. So this should come out to 44,000. $578.42. So notice that the nothing has changed except for the compounding, but from part A to part B, um, you know, we gained essentially $500 just due to the compounding alone. Let's look at monthly. But as I said, there is a limit to this, and this limit is the continuous uh, compound that formula. So if we compound monthly, that would make n equal to 12. Um, so here it's gonna look the same, but everywhere we had a four in part B, we we're gonna change that to a 12. So we've got 30,000 times one plus 0 0.08 divided by 12 raised to the 12 times five. And this comes out to Forty-four thousand six hundred ninety-five thirty-seven. So you see, we've gained a little, but not quite as much as we did. So the gain is kind of dropping off um, due to the compounding. Uh, so lo lastly, let's look at the limit, the most we would get with these rates based on compounding alone. Uh, so D, let's say compounded continuously. So there's no N in this formula. It's just A is equal to 30,000 times E to the 0 0.08 times the number of years we're investing, which is five. So that comes out to 44,754.74. Okay, so that's it. Um, for exponential functions. That's actually as far as I wanted to get today. So we were moving kind of fast, I think. Um, 
but I will uh, open the last 15 minutes up to questions. And if you don't have any, then we will call it a day or you can feel free to leave. Um, we'll look at logarithmic functions next time. And uh, Friday, we'll look at, um, I think probably we'll look at some homework questions.